The gospel lesson today will come, the sermon text today will come from Matthew 28, verse 16. But before we get into the Bible, I, I want to I talk, I want to take today to do a little something a little, little different. I want to talk with you as a congregation about something that's Im, Im, important that's happened in the life of our church. About three weeks ago, the elders of this church met to begin to think about long-term planning for our congregation. And we began to ask the question, what is it that we're doing? What is it that we're trying to accomplish as a, as a congregation, as a corporate body? And so we looked at our mission statement. And what we realized was true about our mission statement is that it was really more of an identity statement. It, it spoke about who we are and who we are mutually supporting one another, who we are uh, existing in and for the community that we're in, but it didn't really talk about where we're headed or, or what we're trying to do. And so I knew that that was true of our mission statement coming in, and so I brought a mission statement that I proposed to the session, to the elders of the church, and it like, goes like this. That Windermere's committed to making disciples who make disciples and planting churches that plant churches. Windermere's committed to making disciples who make disciples and planting churches that plant churches. That's it, that's it, that's the mission statement. And, and we talked about it for a while as a session and we ran over um, a lot of different things in our minds and, and as you're thinking about that mission statement, the Windermere's committed to making disciples that make disciples and planting churches that plant churches. You might think, okay, interesting, making disciples, but what's this about planting churches? Maybe that's the thing that, that sort of piques your interest and r raises your eyebrows a little bit. So, and Windermere's gonna be planting churches? Isn't that the job of Presbytery or some larger body than us? No, well, what we've decided is we're gonna do that. And for a number of reasons. Principally, we're gonna do that uh, because as we think about a mature disciple, what's a mature disciple do? They make disciples, right? They, they bring people to know Jesus. If that's true, then principally, what does a mature church do? It plants churches. <laughs> it makes other, uh, other go uh, gospel preaching churches. And so that's the principle of the matter, but there's more than just the principle of the matter. We also s begin to look at some of the logistics in the matter. If you look at logistically where we're situated in Wilmington, and then if you've read any sort of news or, or looked at any sort of um, newspapers, you'll see that if you, if you were to look at a map of Wilmington, the established parts of the city out of all the established parts of the city, the one that's poised to grow the most in the next 10, 15, 20 years is right here where our church sits. This area, going up Military Cutoff Road, it's supposed to explode. There's gonna be so much growth here, and the question that we asked as, as elders and pastors is what, how are we gonna be faithful with that growth? And not just the growth of the, the city, the population at large, but we also began to look at the, the growth of our church. And we saw that in the last two years, we've added, uh, well, in the last three years, we've, we've had tremendous growth. But especially in the last two years, we've added 20 members every year since then. And that may not sound like a lot for a mega church, but for a church our size, that's tremendous. And as we continue to grow and grow, and we think, yeah, that's wonderful. But we're coming up on a mark that's an interesting mark. It's 150. If you, I, I, in the last, uh, well, since I've been ordained and as a pastor, I've done a lot of reading on church growth, church growth strategies, and it's even true of secular organizations, or if you read anything about organizational growth, the organizations can grow to about 150 active members. Now, that's not people on the rolls, that's people in worship services, about 150 active members. And then what happens to those organizations is they tend to, unless something changes, they tend to plateau or even decline in their growth. And why is that? It's not because we intentionally want to plateau or decline, but it's because there's only so much relational capacity that the human mind has. You can relate to, honestly and earnestly, and engage in people's lives up to about 150. And then after that, your mind sort of says, I, <laughs> I already know 150 people, I can't know any more than that. And, uh, and so when people come into Windermere, what's our strength is that we are a relational church, right? You, you get to know people. As soon as you walk in the door, they say, we're glad you're here. Tell me about yourself. You engage in people relationally. Well, when you hit that 150 mark, you can no longer have that same relational advantage. And the session saw that as we're growing and as the city's growing, we're going to hit that 150 active membership growth in two to six years, maybe two to six years. So what do we want to do? Just stop growing? No, the session said, the elders said, we're not gonna just stop growing, we can't do that, that's not faithful with growth. 
We said, well, then what are we going to do? Are we going to change from a pastoral, relational-sized church, and instead we're going to become a big church? We're going to hire more staff? We're going to become a program church? We're going to build a bigger building? And they said, no, we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that either. Well, so this is long-term planning here. What are we going to do? Are we going to start a second service? And we talked a while about that. But here's what happens when you start a second worship service. Any larger church will tell you this. When you start a second worship service, what it really begins to happen is it feels like two different churches worshiping under the same roof. <laughs> That's what just naturally what happens. And there's, there's some pros and cons to that. But what, what I suggested to the elders is something that I've been reading about for a while that's had some success in other parts of the country. I said, what if we start a second worship service and we just lean into that? We say, yeah, it feels like a second church because it is going to be a second church. So we begin a second worship service, and, and we let that worship service grow to the point that it becomes a sustainable congregation. And then instead of, um, instead of just keeping them within the same roof, we say, no, we're going to plant this congregation as a new church. I love that idea. I, I think when we sit back 10, 15, 20 years from now, and we look out at the church landscape of Wilmington, I'd love to see it filled with our daughter congregations, maybe even our granddaughter congregations. What a powerful impact that'll be for the Lord. And so I laid this, I laid this thought out to the session, this vision out for them. And, and you know what happened? This is miraculous. This, yeah, this is a miraculous thing for Presbyterians that are considering anything important. It was a unanimous vote. <laughs> they unanimously said, yes, that's the direction that the Holy Spirit's leading us. So sometime in early 2019, we're gonna begin a new worship service with the intention of it eventually becoming a church plant for us. Um, I don't know how long it'll take. Like I said, that growth is gonna happen two to six years, so it could be anywhere in that time window. Um, but that's something we'll talk a little bit more about as a church as we get closer and closer to it. What I wanna address today, though, is really the first part of that mission statement that says, Windermere is committed to making disciples that make disciples. That's where it really begins to hit us immediately. That's why you have, by the way, um, notes in your bulletin, uh, a place for notes. It says learn and then teach, because what we want you to do is not just be receivers of information, but transmitters of information. So as you listen to these sermons, I want you to begin to think, how can they apply in my relationships with my neighbors and my coworkers and my family members? How can I begin to transmit the gospel rather than just receive it? So I want to look today at the Great Commission, and the reason why is because, in, in truth, I didn't really come up with this mission statement. I sort of put it in words that are catchy and able to hold on to, but really we as a church shouldn't try to invent some new mission because Jesus has already given us our mission, and he's given it to us in the Great Commission. It's the last words that he leaves his disciples with when he ascends into heaven. And so I want to take a look at those words, and we'll uh, reflect on them a little bit today. Matthew Chapter 28, starting in verse 16. But the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and he spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So in, in us considering this, I want us to, and if you're taking notes, there's four really good words that you can write down. Uh, and we're going to consider them in reverse order. Uh, one of them is to remember. Jesus says, lo, or remember that I'm with you always to the end of the age. So you can write down remember. Uh, the other one is teach. Jesus says, teach them to obey all that I've commanded you. The other, one, the other word I want you to write down is baptize. Jesus says, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And finally, the, the, uh, the first word I, that Jesus mentions, and, but the last one that we'll consider, is make disciples. Now you may say, Pastor, that's two words, not one. <laughs> but in the Greek, it is one word. It's one word. It's uh, disciple. It's disciple is a verb. Go and disciple all nations. Go make disciples in English. So you write down make disciples. And like I said, I want to consider these in reverse order. And I want to begin with this word remember, or lo, Jesus says, lo, I'm with you. Remember, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Why does Jesus say that? Well, he's just given us a tremendous task, to, uh, the most important task. It's his global task to make 
disciples of all nations all over the globe. There's nothing more important for us to do. And, and Jesus sends us out on this mission and, he, and it could be overwhelming for us. So Jesus gives us this word, remember I'm with you always, even to the end of the age, so that uh, we can be both comforted and humbled. Comforted because it's a huge task. How can we do it? Well, Jesus is gonna be with us. Be calm. He'll help us to do it. And then humbled because it, it could be pretty easy to get into the feeling that as we're going out and making disciples, that it's of our own effort and our own work. And so Jesus reminds us, remember, I'm with you. I bring this up a lot every time I get a chance because I think it's a powerful illustration. Billy Graham is probably uh, what was probably the greatest evangelist on American soil, maybe ever, but certainly in modern times. And I ask people this question, how many people do you think Billy Graham saved? I know the exact number. I know exactly how many people Billy Graham saved. Zero. Billy Graham didn't save a single soul. Jesus Christ saved every one of them. And, and this is important for us to remember as we go out to make disciples too, that this is not our work and that we're not able to do it. Jesus sends us out on this colossal task. He says, you're gonna make disciples of all nations. This is a humongous endeavor. And guess what, guys? You're not gonna be able to do it. I'm sending you out on this task anyway, but you're not gonna be able to do it, and that's why I'm going with you. That's what Jesus says. Remember, I'm with you, even to the end of the age. So that as we consider the other three words that we'll look at today, we have to remember that it's under this umbrella of it being Jesus' work and his using us as his instruments to accomplish it. The other word that he uses is teach. Teach them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Um, it's interesting that this word comes after baptize. I think a lot of the times people will, when they're in the discipling process, they think, oh yeah, I've witnessed to someone, they've confessed Jesus as Lord, they've been baptized, now I'm done discipling them. Now it's accomplished. But this reminds us that baptism is not the end of the discipling process, it's really the beginning of the discipling process. That once they're baptized, once they're confessed Christians, once they want to know and follow the Lord, then Jesus says this, now you teach them. So a lot of, a lot of the objection that will arise as we live into this new mission statement is to say, wait a minute, pastor, I know you want me to go out and make disciples, but everybody I already know are Christians already. And I'll say, so what? <laughs> the, the, it says, go and teach them to obey everything that I commanded. There's still a discipling process that goes on, even with people who are professed Christians, unless we assume that we, know, we already know everything that Jesus has commanded us to, to know. Um, and so, so I want to encourage you to continue to disciple people, even after baptism. Um, you know, a lot of the research is showing that, that the generation, my generation, the millennials, I guess I'm, I might even be on the old end of millennials, but the, the millennial generation, one of the things they crave most is a mentor relationship with an, a young women crave a mentor relationship with an older woman. Young men crave a mentor relationship with an older man. But you know what mentoring is? There's a word that the Bible used even before that mentoring was cool. It's discipling. It's discipling. When you think about teaching, some people get overwhelmed. They say, I'm not qualified to teach everything that Jesus taught. Because when they think teaching, here's what you're thinking. You're thinking of a chalkboard back here, and you're going to write on the chalkboard, this is the doctrine of progressive sanctification. Let me show you how this all plays out. That's not what Jesus is mentioning here. Teaching is often going to look a lot different. It's going to look like a, a walk with your neighbor. It's going to look like a dinner with your friend where you show them the way that Jesus has revealed some of his teaching to you in his word. And your job is not to know anything more special than that, it's just to help them see what Jesus has shown you. Teach them to obey everything that I've commanded you. The other word that I wanna bring up, that Jesus brings up, the other aspect of this great commission is baptize. Being baptized is the public declaration that you're in love with Jesus, that you wanna follow him, that you belong to him. And, and, and it's important because it sets us apart. It makes us, in, in a tangible sort of way, say, now I belong to Jesus. It's the first act of Christian obedience. In fact, there might be somebody in this room today who's sitting here saying, I love Jesus. I want to follow him. 
And I've been working at following him my whole life, but I've never been baptized before. And if that's you, I want to say this. Let's do that. Let's get you baptized. If you love Jesus and you're committed to him, we can have you baptized and publicly professed as a Christian. You say, well, then what about, what about children, though? Um, children, obviously, are not able to stand up and profess the faith of Christ. Can we still baptize children? Can they still come? And I say, yeah, because in Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39, after Peter has given his great Pentecost sermon and thousands come, become believers in Christ, and then uh, they say, well, what should, we, what should we do now? And Peter says this, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, For the promise, that is the promise of baptism, is not just for you, but also for your children, for all those who are far off, for all whom the Lord God has called. So the promise is not just for you, it's also for your children. Which means, parents, that as you baptize your children into the faith, your number one person that you need to disciple is your child. You're in a discipling process your entire life as you disciple them into the faith. You can worry all day, wring your hands about, oh, how am I going to bring people to know the Lord outside my household? But it's all for naught if you don't have a strategy to disciple your own children, to bring them up in the, the love and faith of the Lord. Finally, the last word that I had you write down or look at is make disciples. That's what all this is about. That's what all those other words are. And if you're not willing to make disciples, then nothing else makes sense. Why would you bat- what would you baptize people into if you're not willing to make disciples of Jesus? What would you teach them if you're not going to teach them the teachings of Jesus? Who would you go with if, if you weren't going with Jesus? It's all about making disciples of Jesus. And so my, my commission to you, because it's the commission that the Lord gives us, that he gives his church, is to go make disciples. And there might be apprehension about that. I get it. I I get it. You may feel like, I don't know, I'm not really the kind of person that goes out and and makes disciples. I understand that 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 can be a scary thing. And if you have your Bibles and you're looking at it, in verse 17, there's a really interesting thing that happens in that Great Commission, chapter 28, verse 17, says that they, when they came to Jesus, they worshiped and some doubted. Isn't that interesting? That's what this is. When we go out in faith to make disciples, it's an endeavor of faith. And faith is never a scientific certainty. But it's also not saying no to what Jesus has called us to. Faith is somewhere in the middle there. To say, yes, Lord, I'm willing, but I don't know how. And that's what I'm asking for you today. To say, yes, Lord, I'm willing, even if you don't know how. So your homework assignment is this. I want you to begin to look for gospel conversations. I'm not saying that you have to step into those or you have to be ready to engage in them, not this week, not, maybe not even this year. But I want you to begin to, just in your life, every day, begin to look for gospel conversations. Here's what I mean. Anytime that there's, you bump into a friend, a family member, a neighbor, and there's something um, wrong or something not as it should be. I mean, don't we all have those situations in life? Something wrong, something not as it should be. Did you know every time you see that, the gospel has something to say in those circumstances. And I'm not, I don't want you to be ready to jump in there just yet. You can if you feel prepared, but if not, that's fine. I just want you to recognize them this week. When, when you have a neighbor, a friend, a family member who's hurting or who doesn't know what to do, the gospel speaks in those circumstances. And I want you to begin to identify potential gospel conversations. When you're a pastor's kid, you get tired of these gospel conversations. The kids come downstairs and they say, Dad, I'm thirsty. And I say, kids, don't you know Jesus is the living water? Whoever drinks of him will never be thirsty. They say, come on, Dad, just give me some water. (laughs) There's so many ways where people are hurting, where things aren't going like they're supposed to, and you're going to be able eventually to begin to speak the gospel into those circumstances begin to hold out Jesus as a, as a living and eternal hope for people who are hurting and lost and need him so desperately. That's what we want. We want to begin to, here at Windermere to make disciples who make disciples. May this word be to the glory of God and for the joy of his people. Amen.